Welcome back to my video series where we go through Betaflight 4.3 configurator and look at every single option, tell you what it does and how to set it up. In this video, we are looking at the fail safe tab. And if that's what you're here for, stick around. But if you want a complete start to finish tutorial, there's a playlist down in the video description and you could start with video number one and just work your way all the way through. Onto the fail safe tab. And before we talk about all these fail safe options, we got to define what a fail safe is, which may sound kind of dumb because most people kind of have an intuitive understanding of like fail safe is when you lose control and your quadcopter falls out of the air, right? A fail safe can be one of two things. The first thing is the thing you probably think of, where you fly too far away from your controller, your radio link drops out because you, you, you it's too weak and then the flight controller detects that failsafe has occurred and does whatever it's supposed to do when a failsafe occurs. But the second thing that can cause failsafe, and this is what when you say, well, I had failsafe and I was only 20 feet away from myself. The second thing that could cause failsafe is if the receiver powers down or if the signal wire to the flight controller breaks or is otherwise interrupted in some way. So from the flight controller's perspective, it may not know, like all it knows is, the receiver is gone. I'm not getting information anymore and we're gonna do a failsafe. And when that happens, that's when the failsafe tab comes into play. The next thing to understand about failsafe is that Betaflight has two stages of failsafe, stage one and stage two. And stage one failsafe exists because sometimes while flying, you may get a very short dropout that comes back quickly and you don't want the quad to just fall out of the sky if there is a short interruption in your control. Now, with modern protocols like Crossfire, ExpressLRS, and Ghost that just have so much range and penetration, this is less likely than it was with older protocols like FreeSky and Spectrum, but it still can sometimes happen. Stage one failsafe will last for as long as this parameter, the guard time for stage two activation. And this parameter is given in tenths of a second. So by default, stage one failsafe will last for 0.4 seconds. And if the failsafe condition ends before 0.4 seconds or whatever you set this to, then you, nothing will happen. The quad will just keep flying and you will regain retain control of the quad. Now, what happens to the control channels when the quad goes into stage one failsafe? That is where the channel fallback settings come into play. When the flight controller enters stage one failsafe, all of the channels will do what they are configured to do here in the channel fallback settings. Let's go into those details just a little bit more. For the roll, pitch, yaw, and throttle channels, we have three options, auto, hold, and set. And I'm gonna take these in the opposite order from how they're normally used. Set will mean that this channel will go to a preset value that you choose right here. 1500 is middle position, 2000 is all the way up, 1000 is all the way down. You would not do this for a multi-rotor. The only time you might do this might be for a fixed wing plane where you want the, uh, maybe the ailerons or elevators or I don't fly fixed wings. You want the control surfaces to go to a fixed position. This is extremely, you wouldn't do this for a multi-rotor. Hold means that the channel will hold its last input value that it was at before it went into stage one failsafe. The sticks will basically freeze exactly how they were. And auto means something slightly different for roll pitch and yaw versus throttle. For roll pitch and yaw, auto means that the channel will go to center, the stick will center up, and for throttle, the channel will go to low. So Betaflight's default behavior when it goes into stage one failsafe is that the sticks center up and the throttle goes to low. If you were to change these to hold, it would just keep doing the last thing that it was doing before failsafe began. So if you were in acro mode and you were rolling to the left, you'd keep rolling to the left. If you were in a full throttle punch out, you'd keep punching out. I could see an argument for auto versus hold. Some people might like hold. If you were gonna set it to hold, you might prefer to reduce this guard time just a little bit. So if you were in a full throttle punch out, you wouldn't stay that way for nearly half a second. But the default is center position and 
low throttle. Now for the aux channels, the default is to hold the last value. The idea being that if you were in angle mode, if your aux channel was putting you into angle mode at the time that you went into stage one failsafe, you would want to stay in angle mode. The alternative for that is set, which lets you set a fixed position for this. Uh, an example of why you might do that. Let me set up an aux mode here real quick. So here in the aux modes, I'm going to add a beeper uh, range. It doesn't really matter. I don't really have a receiver hooked up here. We're going to set up a beeper and we're going to say that the beeper is going to go off when aux one is low. If we then go back to the failsafe tab, notice that beeper mode is being called out as being on aux one. That's a thing that the failsafe tab does. It shows you your defined aux modes. Uh, and then what I could do is I could say that I'm going to set aux one at 1000 when we go into failsafe. And what that means is that when we failsafe, the beeper will start beeping because that channel will go to the position that causes that aux mode to activate. Well, it turns out that when you failsafe, the beeper already goes off. So this is a little bit redundant, but that's the idea there. Another thing that you would use this for, if we go into the receiver tab, if you are using the RSSI channel function, Let's say we've got uh, our Crossfire receiver set up to put RSSI on aux four, okay? Well, the default behavior for that aux channel is to hold its last position at the time of failsafe, which means that when you go into failsafe, if you were at 20% RSSI, it will just continue to show 20% RSSI on your OSD, which is a little annoying because you failsafe, so shouldn't it show 0% RSSI? If you're using an RSSI aux channel, what I recommend you do is set the failsafe position for that aux channel to 1000, and that will force the RSSI readout in your goggles to show 0% when you failsafe. It won't change the fact that you failsafe, but at least your RSSI will be consistent with reality. So that is stage one fail safe. And I should say, if you're flying and you're experiencing stage one fail safe, like little moments where the controls lock out and the throttle goes to zero and then comes back again, that take that seriously because you're on the edge of a stage two fail safe and losing your quad potentially or crashing your quad. Um, troubleshooting the fail safe, that's a topic for another video, but definitely notice when that's happening and take it seriously. Next, we're going to talk about stage two failsafe. What is the quad going to do when you fully lose the link? But before we do that, if you learned something in this video, if I told you something that you didn't know before, would you mind going down and hitting the like button? It helped me out a lot. Let's do it. So we've gone into failsafe. We've been in stage one failsafe for longer than this guard time. And then we enter stage two failsafe. And what will the quad do when that happens? The default behavior is that it will drop. It will simply disarm and fall out of the sky. And that might sound dumb because like, really? But actually everything else Betaflight does is in some sense potentially worse than just dropping the damn thing. And especially because a lot of times Betaflight is being used with little racing drones that are extremely tough and designed to be crashed. A lot of times just dropping the damn thing and just going and picking it up again is actually the best case scenario. But the real reason Betaflight defaults to drop is that the smart things that like a DJI drone would do, where it just goes into GPS loiter and hovers in midair and doesn't go anywhere, or maybe it returns to home, Betaflight just isn't good or can't do that. It has a GPS rescue function. We'll talk about that in a second. So the default behavior is to drop, and many people feel that's the right behavior. Many people flying $15,000 cinema rigs on movie sets and commercials, and I asked him, wouldn't you like to have some kind of GPS return to home? And, and he said, well, look, when I'm chasing a car going 40 miles an hour on a set, I don't want the damn, if I fail safe, God forbid, I don't want the damn thing to like try to fly home and crash into somebody. I just want it to fall and we'll let the insurance pick up the pieces. So drop is the default behavior and that's not actually a bad thing. If you really want autonomous return to home, hover, loiter, all that stuff, you should be using RG Pilot or iNav. Betaflight just isn't good at it. Now, the next thing you could choose is land. And what this means is, that the flight controller will enter auto level mode. So it will flatten out the quad 
and then it will put the throttle at a certain predetermined value. And the default value is 1000, which is just zero throttle, which means it'll auto level, idle the props and come straight down. Now you could set that to some other value. And what some people will do is they will hover the quad and they will very carefully figure out the throttle position that just barely lets the quad gently descend to the earth. And then after this amount of time, 10 seconds, or sorry, one second, this is tenths of a second, after one second, the quad will disarm. And the reason the quad just goes to a certain throttle position and then disarms after a certain amount of time is that Betaflight doesn't have the capability of knowing, oh, I've landed, oh, I've touched down. It just doesn't have that. So this is an extremely rudimentary form of sort of auto landing. What can go wrong with it? Imagine you carefully set that throttle position so your quad very gently descends to earth, but then one day you're flying without a GoPro and that 150 or 200 grams of difference in weight means that now instead of descending, you're climbing. Oh, so now your clever plan to auto land your quad is all amok. It's not, it's, there are ways to do this landing function and have it be better than others. But the bottom line is that it is extremely rudimentary. And if you are gonna set it up, you should test it very carefully under various conditions to be sure that it's gonna do what you think it's gonna do. I mean, if you set this delay for turning off to 50, the quad will go to it, whatever, it'll auto level and go to the throttle position for five seconds. Well, what if you just drift into a tree? And now for five seconds, your quad is just beating the props against the branches and you burn out your ESC. These are the kind of things you should think about before you use this landing function. The third thing the quadcopter can do when it goes into stage two failsafe is GPS rescue. And this is Betaflight's attempt to implement a very rudimentary return to home. And I say very rudimentary because Betaflight doesn't assume that it's gonna have a barometer and it doesn't assume that it's gonna have a compass. Many times the flight controllers we're using on these little tiny racing drones don't have those sensors. And in fact, compass sensors, magnetometers are actually, they usually don't work well because racing drones are so compact that the compass is right up next to the video transmitter and the receiver and the flight controller. And there's so much um, electrical interference that the magnetometer can't get a good reading. If you look at big, GPS drones, a lot of times the GPS will be up on a, on a mast to get it away from the electronics or just the, the aircraft itself is so large, the GPS can be kept away from the electronics. So Betaflight does this all based on GPS and it can use those sensors, the barometer and the compass if they exist, but it just doesn't work very well because this isn't a focus of the Betaflight devs. It's kind of an afterthought. So we call it GPS rescue and not GPS return to home. And I want you to understand the behavior because it is not return to home. What Betaflight will do when it enters GPS rescue is it will f ascend, it will climb to a certain altitude. We'll talk about how to set that altitude. It will then fly towards home as best it can. Once it gets within a certain distance of home, it will begin to descend. And at some point in that process, it expects that you will get the link back and you will take control. And if you don't, it's who knows what will happen. I've seen cases where it descends towards home and then it kind of overshoots and it climbs back up again and it just keeps doing this little loop-de-loop-de -loop spiral around the home position. I've seen cases where it descends and it just crashes into the ground or hits a tree and then it's like, ah, and it crashes. That's why it's GPS rescue and not really return to home in a proper sense like DJI, iNav, or RG Pilot. Now, as far as the parameters for GPS rescue go, I wanna focus on a couple of these first because they're the most important ones. And then I will cover the others because the point of this video is to talk about every single option, but some of these are a little more important than others. And the first one I wanna talk about is the minimum satellites. Minimum satellites is the minimum number of GPS sats that Betaflight needs to see locked in order for it to attempt to do GPS rescue. So if you set your failsafe behavior to GPS rescue, but you don't have eight by default satellites locked, when you fail safe, Betaflight will just fall out of the air. It won't work. Now, many GPS units used on racing drones are bad. 
and struggle to lock eight satellites. So you can decrease this to as low as six or maybe even five, although that's really on the edge. And the reason I say it's really on the edge is the fewer satellites you have locked, the worse your position information is. So when Betaflight tries to fly home, it will do a better job of flying to your actual home position if it has more sats liked, locked. Six is really the absolute minimum for safe operations. Some people go down to five, but I think that's extreme. And eight is the default, and you should ideally be able to get eight. Uh, but if you absolutely can't get eight sats locked on, on, your, on your drone, you could decrease it a little bit. Allow arming without fix. By default, if you have GPS rescue enabled as your fail-safe mode, Betaflight will not let you arm unless you have at least eight satellites or however many you set here fixed. You can't arm. It's like, sorry, I'm not going to let you do this. If you want the option to arm without your, your GPS fix and you know that if then you fail safe, GPS rescue won't work, then you can enable allow arming without fix. Bear in mind that if you enable allow arming without fix and take off without sats locked, and then during flight, you get eight or nine or 12 satellites locked. GPS rescue still doesn't work. You have to have the sats locked at the time of arming for arming without fix to work because uh, the home position is set at the moment that you arm. A good reason to allow arming without fix is if you often fly both indoors and outdoors, or if you fly undercover where you can't get a GPS lock. If you have this option disabled, when you bring the quad indoors, you simply can't arm it. But if you do allow arming without fix, then you can choose to take off when you're indoors without a sat lock. You just need to be aware if you're outdoors that you, you might be taking off without GPS rescue working. Altitude mode determines what altitude the aircraft will try to ascend to at the moment that GPS rescue kicks in. So the idea is that you want it to climb to an altitude that is safe to fly straight home, okay? It's not going to try to do any clever stuff like fly around obstacles. It is going to climb to an altitude and fly straight home. So if there's a tree or something that you could crash into, you want it to be above that. By default, Betaflight will climb to the maximum altitude that you flew at during flight. So if you took off, you flew up to 200 feet, you flew over a tree or something, then you flew down. When GPS rescue kicks in, it'll go back to 200 feet, whatever the maximum altitude. Uh, you can also choose a fixed altitude, uh, which if you know you're flying in a location where you always want to fly back at a certain altitude. For example, at my house, if I take off and I fly down my driveway to the end of my driveway, the maximum altitude during that flight might be 20 meters. But I have trees that might be 40 or 50 meters. If beta flight flies home, at the max altitude, it will still hit the trees. So I might set that to fixed altitude, and then where do you put in the fixed altitude? That's right here, initial altitude meters. I would put in the height at which I wanted it to fly home, and it would always fly home at exactly that height. And then lastly, we have the choice of current altitude, which flies home at the current altitude, whatever it might be. And you would only wanna do that if you were sure you were flying like out in the desert or somewhere with no obstructions. It will not climb, it will not descend, it will just attempt to come straight home at whatever your current altitude is. The remaining parameters here control the, what the flight controller will try to do with the quad while it is trying to fly home. So for example, the ground speed is how fast in ground speed the quadcopter will attempt to fly home. And of course, this is relevant because you know you may be in a headwind, you may be in a tailwind, and it will just try and hold a consistent ground speed based on your, your GPS reading of by default 20 meters per second. You can change that. If that's too slow, then you could try to have it come home faster, but there's only so fast the quad will be able to go uh, based on how far you let it pitch over. So that brings us to the angle parameter. The angle parameter is the maximum angle in degrees that the quad will pitch over. So by default, it will not pitch further than 30 to 32 degrees. And if that lets it achieve a ground speed of 20 meters per second, so much the better. But if you need to tip over further to let it try to fly faster, you could increase that angle. If you're flying in a place where there's like a lot of wind, you might want to increase this angle because it'll need to pitch over further to get more thrust in order to counteract the wind. But the further over it pitches, the harder the PID controller has to work and it can kind of get into this weird mode where it's pitching back and forth and motors surging and kind of being crazy. So you want to keep this angle number low if 
possible if it lets you get enough speed to get home. The throttle min and throttle max are the minimum and maximum throttle value that the flight controller will use to try to get home. Uh, the reason that it's uh, a minimum of 1100 is you don't wanna go all the way down to idle and just have the quad fall out of the air, but you also have a maximum of 1600 because you don't want it to just go bah, full throttle, or maybe you do. Again, if you're in a situation where you've got a lot of wind or other you otherwise need to get home faster, you might wanna raise the throttle maximum as well as the angle to get a little more speed coming home. The hover throttle, the hover throttle is used to know approximately where the quadcopter will neither climb nor descend. Of course, it's gonna be using the GPS altitude and the barometer if you have one to try to manage its altitude, but the throttle hover helps it manage its altitude. So you would just, you would hover the quad and you would set that to whatever your hover uh, throttle is. The remaining options relate to the quad's decision to begin to descend as it gets close to the home point. So we've got the descent distance in meters, which is 200 meters. The quad will begin to descend towards the home point at 200 meters out, and it will descend at a rate of 1.5 meters per second. That's the default. You could tweak those if you wanted to change those for some reason. Oh, and we've overlooked the ascent rate, which is how fast it will climb at the beginning of the GPS rescue. Uh, and that can be pretty extreme. Some people, like, it, you go into GPS rescue and it just goes, wow, up in the sky. So you can change that if you want that to go faster or slower. And then the last thing here is minimum distance to home. And that is Betaflight will not enable GPS rescue unless you are at least a certain distance from home. And the default is 100 meters. If you fail safe closer than 100 meters to your home point, which is where you armed, it just drops out of the air. And this seems kind of dumb because 100 meters is pretty far and what the heck is going on here? The idea is that when it first goes into failsafe, its position accuracy is not always that great and its position hold is not that great because like we said, this isn't DJI or iNav or Ardu Pilot. And so it may sort of pop up and it may kind of wander around a little before it starts flying home. It may go the wrong direction for a moment. And the idea is that if you're close to the home position, we don't want to risk hitting you. So by default, it won't fail safe. It won't GPS rescue within 100 meters of home. You should put the distance to home arrow or distance to home parameter in your OSD. And if that is less than 100 meters, GPS rescue isn't working. You can change this as low as, I think you can change it as low as 50. You can't change it lower than 50 meters though. Finally, we have sanity checks and sanity checks is the flight controller looking at the GPS and other sensor data and saying, is everything going okay? Like, if my altitude is just going up and down and up and down and going crazy, maybe I should just disarm because maybe my data isn't accurate. I'm, if I've, if I've, like, if I'm upside down <laughs> or something, maybe I should just disarm. Sanity checks, the main sanity check that gets you in trouble is this minimum distance to home. That is a sanity check. And if you want to disable that, you can just disable sanity checks. Um, if you do that though, then instead of disarming when Betaflight thinks something is going wrong, potentially it will just fly to the moon or crash into a tree and not disarm. Various things can go wrong. So what some people do is they set sanity checks to fail safe only, which means that if I manually trigger GPS rescue, then there will be no fit sanity check because the assumption is that if anything starts to go wrong, then I can manually untrigger GPS rescue and take control. But if I actually fail safe, then we're gonna have sanity checks uh, for safety. Speaking of manually triggering things, let's go back to the modes tab real quick and just remind you of a couple failsafe related modes. We did talk about these in the modes tab video, which is in the playlist down below, but uh, the first one is gonna be the failsafe aux mode. If you set up the failsafe aux mode, then when you flick that switch, the flight controller will pretend that a failsafe has occurred. This is used for testing failsafe, mostly by developers, but if you wanted to test your GPS rescue, you could do it by testing, by, by, by setting up a failsafe aux mode. There's just a couple more options left here in the failsafe tab. Uh, failsafe switch determines what that failsafe aux mode is going to do. When I flick the failsafe aux mode, does it emulate stage one failsafe Stage two failsafe, do we just skip stage one and go straight to stage two, or do we just kill the quad? Those are three options for what we could do if we've set up the failsafe aux mode 
in the modes tab. And then finally, we have the valid pulse range settings, which is the valid min and max value for any aux channel. Um, these values you would almost never change, but if a channel goes outside of these values, like if you set your endpoints really extremely off, then it will kick the quad into fail safe. And w historically, just a little funny story, way back when, before there was a failsafe switch, people would manually trigger failsafe by setting one of their control channels to go below 885, and it would manually trigger failsafe. But we don't have to do that anymore because we have the failsafe switch. There's one parameter left to talk about, and that is the failsafe throttle load delay. Here's the purpose of that. Let's say that I arm my quad and I haven't taken off. I haven't raised the throttle at all. I'm just sitting there idling on the ground, and then like the battery on my controller dies. And now we're in failsafe. Should we GPS rescue at that point? I mean, we couldn't GPS rescue because the we're not more than 100 meters from the home position. But anyway, what Betaflight will do is if you have not had the throttle raised for at least this long, where this is in tenths of a second, so this is 100 tenths of a second or 10 seconds, if the throttle hasn't been raised for at least this long, then instead of fail-safing, we'll just disarm. And if you have stage two fail-safe set to drop, then... That'll kind of be the same thing anyway. It'll just disarm. But the idea is that if you never even took off, we don't need to do a fancy fail safe. We need to just, we'll just, we'll just disarm and we'll drop it. Next up, we are going to talk about the video transmitter tab. One of the most frustrating and confusing tabs in all of Betaflight, but we're going to make it make sense. That's the next video in this playlist. And if it's out, I'll put a card on screen linking to it. Otherwise, there's another card linking to the entire playlist and you can check out the other videos as well as a link in the video description. I'll see you there.